our next speaker, sort of in, in the spirit of community and small worldness that we're trying to build here in Breitmine, is Amit Etkin, who got his PhD on the eighth floor of Kolb, one floor up from me. Um, and he is now an, in Eric Kendall's lab. He is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford, and he is an emerging well-known entity in our field. He is often up here on stage introducing the speakers and running these programs. Uh, he is also a 2017 NIH Director's Award recipient, and he studies many things in the field of psychiatry, but particularly non-invasive brain stimulation as treatment, and also predictive neural signals as a way to figure out who may be responsive to different treatments in psychiatry. Amit? Hi there, good morning. Um, I have to say, I, I, I'm used to giving talks in academic conferences. You usually don't come up to music. I think that's totally awesome. If we can do Eye of the Tiger, I think <laughs> we feel even better. So what I'm going to try to um, do um, in this talk is really invite you to um, think together um, and discuss some of the basic issues that bedevil us in psychiatry. So I'm a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. And um, what I'm going to try to tell you about, what I'm going to try to invite you to, to question, is some of the basic organizational concepts we have in psychiatry that perhaps um, are part of the problem rather than part of the solution and, and ask what if our basic assumptions about psychiatry uh, and about mental illness were wrong. And uh, we know that they may be wrong because we see figures like this. We spend more, this is uh, insurance uh, company spending on healthcare. We spend more on mental illness than any other organ system and that's not a curve we're bending anytime soon. Uh, Albert Einstein said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different answer. And yet that's exactly what we're doing in psychiatry. So let's start to examine some of these basic assumptions we make and see where that lands us. Assumption number one, that the way we diagnose in psychiatry is valid. So that's not to say that mental illnesses are not valid. They are absolutely valid. This, in fact, May is mental uh, health Awareness Month. But the way we make our diagnoses right now are based on checklists of symptoms decided by committees sitting in rooms like this, where you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and that gives you a diagnosis. We don't question when our uh, cardiologist makes a diagnosis of a particular form of heart failure, and yet we have problems even in our definition of diagnoses in psychiatry. Let me illustrate this to you. Let's take the, let's call it old diagnostic manual, DSM-4 on the left, and DSM-5, the new one that came out a few years ago on the right. And let's just look at one disorder as an example, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. In DSM-4, there were three clusters of symptoms, and you had 80,000 different ways as a consequence to meet criteria for that disorder. DSM-5 changed to four clusters, and now, because of some shifts that it made, we had 600,000 different ways to meet criteria for the disorder, but that's not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that there's only a 50% overlap in the diagnosis between one addition to the next. But as odd and problematic as this is, it's actually a great opportunity for us because it shows us that these choices are arbitrary. We can just as easily redefine it if it's more useful as go with this definition. One way to redefine is by looking at the brain. So over the years, we've looked at, at meta-analyses, quantitative summaries of brain structure and brain activation across all major psychiatric disorders, which you see listed at the top here. And one of the interesting things that came out of that was the um, idea first in looking at brain structure that actually what you see in the brain is not differences that validate diagnoses, it's actually the forest that we miss when we focus on the trees. This is actually the pattern of gray matter loss in three areas that are well known and interconnected across all psychiatric disorders, independent of what symptoms you have. And by the way, there are no symptoms that overlap between these conditions. The same kind of thing is seen when people are doing cognitive tasks in the scanner, the same exact regions. And the reason for that is that this is a well-known network that serves as a warning flag for the brain. 
and it's important in functions like cognition, emotion, and you can see even structurally it's altered. All right, so if diagnoses are a problem, let's continue to, to uh, elaborate on this. The second assumption we make every single day when we treat a patient is that a drug works for a psychiatric diagnosis. You can see where this is starting to go, right? So let me show you a result. This is from a study called Embark, which um, collaborated here with Madhukar Trivedi on. And what you see is in blue, patients who got sertraline, about 300 depressed patients, and in red, patients who got placebo. So it's about a 42% response rate with drug and 34% or so with placebo. So just as a show of hands, how many people, based on this data, would say, I'm going to treat my patient with sertraline? Zoloft is its brand name. So come on, nobody would really? It's an FDA-approved drug. <laughs> But this is actually exactly the typical outcome you see when you look across all antidepressant studies, a tiny little effect. So the question is, does the drug work? Well, on the one hand, you have people like Irving Kirsch doing studies um, here reported in uh, The Guardian that argue that the drug doesn't work. It's not that different from placebo. Uh, this was in 2008. In 2018, Andrea Cipriani came along and did more or less the same thing, but there's a different conclusion in this case, that the drugs do work. And if you read in the bottom there, it says it's official. Antidepressants are not snake oil or a conspiracy. But the funny part of all this was that the outcomes, the difference in drug and placebo was exactly the same in both of these studies. What changed is our perception and our desperation clinically. So maybe this isn't even the right question to be asking. Maybe the right question to be asking is whether a treatment can define a patient because a treatment is a biological entity, a chemical entity with a specific biological effect. Maybe that's where our anchor should be. In other words, if we take our depressed patients and we can find a way to split them into two types, let's call that type a sensitive type to a drug or another intervention or a resistant type. Obviously, the sensitive type should get that treatment and we'll get back to what the resistant type should get in a minute. But maybe that's a way to define the illness biologically, not based on our symptom-based uh, measures. So we're going to look at this study, this Embark study, comparing Zoloft and placebo, and we're going to look at EEG data. This is uh, in real time, your EEG. This is what happens. All these brain waves going on at the same time all over your brain. What we did is we developed a machine learning approach specifically tailored for EEG that encodes the kind of structure and information that you find in EEG to develop signatures, brain signatures, that can map onto treatment outcome uh, and be used both scientifically and we think in important ways clinically. Why is EEG an attractive tool here? Well, number one, EEG is a cheap uh, way to get in and measure the brain, especially in the clinic. It can be done very quickly at point of care. It's richly informative as a direct measure of brain function. Emery Brown very nicely showed an example in anesthesia. But you have to think about how you structure this kind of analysis, how you build the tools, because it's not just simply you put these things together and magic comes out. So what does EEG reveal for, to us in this case? If you take all patients um, who got a drug versus placebo, I showed you these results before, not particularly exciting, obviously, right? Now if you take the prediction generated by our machine learning approach on people who were not in the model, in other words, we developed the model and applied it to other people, um, you find that we have vast differences between people in their outcomes with treatment. So what you see in the bars there in blue is dividing based on the predicted outcome that you have with medication to be in the lowest quartile, the middle two quartiles, or the highest quartile. You can see the patients in the highest quartile, they respond at a 70% rate, double that of placebo. The patients in the lowest quartile actually do a little worse than placebo. They mainly just get side effects, right? So these folks are all being treated the same way, but maybe there's a different way to think about this. Moreover, um, if you look at the relationship between this signal and symptoms, which we use to define the illness, there's no relationship between them at all. 
All right, so that's one form of treatment, medication treatment, but there's other forms of treatment that Rebecca alluded to, which is brain stimulation or non-invasive brain stimulation, something called TMS. The concept here is you stimulate parts of the brain, you can evoke activity um, that you're, can, you can visualize in yellow there downstream, and do this repetitively can be, become a form of treatment. So we then asked, if we take the medication signal, and now we look at people who had EEG before an RTMS treatment, what does this tell us about RTMS? And early work uh, that we and others had done had suggested that actually some of the things that predict medication outcome predict in the opposite direction, it seemed, RTMS outcome. So we were very pleased to see the following. Now dividing these subjects based on their predicted medication response, we find that we can also predict RTMS response, in this case, in the opposite direction. The people who would respond poorly to medication respond well to RTMS and vice versa. So that's pretty exciting. That starts to um, let us think about selecting treatments based on um, EEG and machine learning. We, we've shown that um, EEG and machine learning can look, can predict outcomes with different types of RTMS. It's not just a neurostimulation or a chemical intervention. Psychotherapy can also be predicted. Rehabilitation for drug addiction can be predicted. And we can even detect the changes acutely with single doses um, of an intervention. Finally, assumption number three. If we have taken this issue of diagnosis off the table and are redefining people based on their biology, how far can we push this? Um, that is, we also, in not just psychiatry, but broadly neuroscience, have assumed that the differences that matter uh, are those between people, that that is what captures relevant biology. Let me give you a thought example to test this concept. So this is, a, we're taking sort of the onion, taking it apart here. So this has nothing to do with neuroscience, or at least not on its face. If you look at the correlation across people between their typing speed and their error rate, you see something like this. So you might say that this describes a relationship in reality. However, if you look at individual people, it actually might look something like this. On the left, with a cross-sectional view, it's simply people who are better, who are faster, more experienced, they have fewer errors and they go faster. However, for any one person, if you push them to go faster, they're going to start making more errors. You get fundamentally different answers when you look at the individual versus the, um, uh, the, in, at the individual over time versus um, groups of individuals looked cross-sectionally. We're now doing this at the level of the brain. So here what I'm going to show you is brain data from a single person whom we've looked at their positive emotion from week to week and the connectivity in two particular networks. The details of these networks are not um, important here, but I'm happy to elaborate later on. Um, what you see here is a video looking at the connectivity of, uh, in one case, the DMN or, do or default mode network. On the right is the connection between two different networks. On the left, the, the connectivity, the intensity of this connectivity is oppositely related to emotion in blue from week to week. On the right, the network tracks emotion over time. So this is the brain vital of a person as relates to their emotional life and how it varies from week to week. In order to advance then precision psychiatry knowing all this, I would argue that we should totally rethink what our diagnosis is about. Why are we making diagnoses? How are the tools leveraged to make diagnoses? But not even just think of the, the diagnostic as the point of stopping there. Rather, the point is to identify the brain signatures that allow us to develop new drugs, to develop new brain stimulation approaches, and develop new ways of tracking people, this concept of a brain vital. Um, in order to, at the end of this, and by the way, I don't think it's that far in the future, in the coming years to have circuit targeting treatments explicitly as opposed to an antidepressant. Let me pause here and just say that this is what we've been working on with a variety of colleagues, but all of this um, comes in the context of work going on um, at Stanford, which I have the privilege today to introduce to you. Um, we are here a contingent of eight faculty uh, members coming to share our work with you. Um, and so I'm just going to outline a little bit for you what the work at Stanford is about. Um, and then the other speakers will obviously elaborate in much greater detail on what they do. The point here is to illustrate that what we're trying to go for at Stanford is not just neuroscience, is not just psychiatry, but really merging these. As, as you can see there in the figure, as a closed loop. 
going from basic science, leading basic scientists, some of whom you'll hear from today, um, who form a close relationship between the clinical side and the Neurosciences Institute, and smoothly translating that into clinic-based neuroscience, into advancing analytics, into a lifespan and cross-disorder perspective, but not even just stopping there, thinking about how you get outside the lab, how you engage the community, and how neuroscience impacts policy. These are the speakers who you'll hear from today in our Stanford contingent that um, I'm happy to, to share with you. But let me kind of illustrate, just going one by one, very, very briefly, how we're trying to close that loop as a group. Because that's really where the excitement is, is the translation of neuroscience um, back and forth from the clinic. Luis de Licea will ask questions such as, what controls sleep in a rodent? And then, can sleep be in turn controlled? Uh, Narao Shah will talk about um, how the brain determines sex differences. Meanwhile, David Hong will pick up the baton and ask how sex influence mental health and sex influences on mental health work via the brain and how that works in reverse. Karen Parker will ask whether there are biomarkers for autism, but just in the same vein, ask whether those biomarkers, in fact, are a way to get to a treatment target for autism. Uh, Vinod Menon will talk about brain mechanisms of learning abilities and flip that over and say, can you train these abilities and can you improve learning? Manish Sagar will talk about individualized neuroimaging and being able to actually encapsulate this in computational models. Um, I talked about reconceptualizing psychiatric illness, but then turning that into treatments. And finally, Keith Humphreys will ask how neuroscience can seriously inform policy that affects all of us, even if we're not doing brain scans. And with that, I'd like to thank you and look forward to all of the talks here and uh, share if you're interested in learning more about Stanford, any of us can answer those questions offline. Thank you very much.